Most people think of the Civil War as the South versus the North, Union versus Confederate. But we are going to take you behind the scenes during the Civil War in North Carolina to show you how, during wartime, some of us were fighting a different fight, our own fight, a fight for our rights. First, we're going to see what problems Lumbee people were dealing with near Wilmington and how they solved it. During the war, Wilmington was an important port for the Confederacy. The Confederates needed a fort to protect Wilmington, so they built Fort Fisher. The amount of manpower needed to build Fort Fisher was so great, the Confederate Army tried to force Lumbee Forced. into the effort. Their fancy word for it was conscription. Uh, conscription. The Home Guard, a band of local men who were either too old or too young to fight in the Army as soldiers, were in charge of making sure Lumbees did the work. As you can guess, Lumbees did not like being forced to work on the fort for little or no pay at all. Many Lumbees escaped, but a large number were still made unwilling and unpaid workers. Did someone say slavery? It sure sounds like slavery. As a result of this forced labor, many Lumbee were furious at the Americans. Then one day, a man took off with a ruthless gang of fellow Lumbee and made white men perish for their acts against his people. His name was Henry Barry Lowry. There are still Lumbee in North Carolina today. We were able to interview two of the tribe's leaders at the American Indian Heritage Celebration in Raleigh. Henry Barry and his gang were known as being excellent guerrilla fighters. They could hide out in the swamps, they knew the swamps very well, and so that was their comfort zone. And um, so they had different set hiding places in various communities they could hide out in and the support of the community. Henry Barry Lowry was like a local Robin Hood. At one point, North Carolina's Governor James Worth put a reward out for Henry Barry Lowry's capture. In the end, no one knows for sure what happened to him, but we do know that he was a great man who fought against discrimination on behalf of the Lumbee tribe so that they could live their lives on their own terms. Before 1861, the journey to freedom for enslaved blacks was long and treacherous. But all of that changed in 1862, when Union forces grabbed portions of the North Carolina coast centered around the city of New Bern. This made freedom that much closer for enslaved people in the South, and they escaped to the city in large numbers. This migration of fugitive slaves to New Bern was the beginning of an unsung civil rights movement in North Carolina, and it came a century before the well-known civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s. New Bern quickly grew into a thriving city with a huge working, business-owning, elite black population. And it is here, in New Bern, that our research brings us to our second hero. There, the freedmen and fugitive slaves met up with a charismatic spymaster, more cunning than any James Bond could ever be. More skills than Chuck Norris. I mean, what? maybe not that skilled, but you get the point. I mean, get this, 6,000 people came to his funeral. That's even more than the entire population of New Bern at the time. His name was Abraham Galloway, and he was so secretive that only one picture of him exists. We were intrigued by Galloway's stories and wanted to find out more. So one of our young scholars, Eden, sat down with the historian David Soselski, who had spent seven years tracking down the history of this elusive character. So when I was doing research on Abraham Galloway, mm -hmm. I read that he kind of separated himself from the Union soldiers and started to focus more on the um, free people in the South. Sure. The Union's commitment, the North's commitment to African-American freedom was far too weak. His work as a Union Army spy sort of moves towards becoming an organizer of the freed people, of the former slaves. And gradually, part of his work behind enemy lines becomes helping those people kind of pull together and, and make their way to freedom. It was Galloway's masterful use of wit and his willingness to do whatever was necessary for his end goal that opened a huge door for the civil rights of freed men during the Civil War. 
In fact, he was so influential and successful that later in his life, after the war, he was elected Senator of North Carolina. He used this platform to promote the rights of another group, women. Women's rights for the people, by the people, just not by the women. Historian's warning. Side effects of women not having any rights may include domestic violence, bread riots, depression, anxiety, child abuse, rape, an incomplete society, narrow viewpoints, murder, decrease in economy and death. Many women were struggling when their husbands, sons, and fathers went off to war. There were 135,000 households in North Carolina at the time, and 120,000 men from the state were in the army. So almost every household had at least one man serving the army. Life was hard. Moving regiments of soldiers would take anything they came across, including crops, fences, and livestock. Due to speculators, prices of normally cheap or reasonably priced goods had risen too much, and shortages were rampant. In Salisbury on March 18, 1863, a group of mothers and wives of Confederate soldiers stormed many stores that were Union blocked. Michael Brown, one of the store owners, reported that when he refused to put reasonable prices on his goods, the women attempted to break down his door armed with hatchets. We wanted to learn more about the experience of women in the Civil War. So we went to talk to our friend Lorraine Umfleet in New Bern. She's an expert on North Carolina's history and a reenactor at the Tryon Palace. When we met with her, she was dressed in period clothing. During the occupation, uh, access to goods and services for Newburn was different than it was in other parts of the state. Now, the problem in that equation is access to money. So there were women, most of the time these were African American enterprising women, we know two of them, Mary Jane and Sarah Connor, and they were Newburn women, we're not sure if they were enslaved before the war, but we do know what they did when the Union got here which was to find a house that was vacant. They turned it into a boarding house. They leased rooms out. They cooked for the soldiers. They mended their clothes. And they made an enterprise for themselves. And that's just the perfect example of making lemonade out of lemons. When the men surrendered at Appomattox and Bennett Place at the end of the war, they had to walk back to their homes. These were changed men. Gone was the bravado. They were beaten, exhausted, hungry. They had a hard life ahead and no slave labor available to help them in the rebuilding. Sometimes, rather than come home to face more struggle, soldiers chose to run off to the West and never see their wives and families again. After being the heads of households for the entire war, did these women pursue their civil rights like the freed African Americans, the Cherokee, and the Lumbee? Did they press for the right to vote like the women of the North? No. Unfortunately, it was another 60 years till women won the right to vote. Women were the driving force on the home front and kept both the Union and the Confederacy alive during the war. Most people know the story of the 1838 Cherokee Trail of Tears, which forced thousands of Cherokee Native Americans from their homes to Oklahoma on a treacherous walk covering more than 2,000 miles. However, the Eastern Band of Cherokee were able to stay on their land because of the work of our third hero. William Holland Thomas. We talked to Dr. Ben Fry, who explained how we did this. Dr. Fry, who was William Thomas? So William Holland Thomas was the adopted son of Chief Drowning Bear, or Yona Gushka. Um, and he was adopted by Chief Drowning Bear when he was maybe 10 or 12 years old. And he lived with the Cherokees, so he was very much a part of the community. And um, it just so happened to be sort of a happy coincidence that he, he, he was white. And so that allowed him to um, help out the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in a lot of ways later on in his life. We checked in with Joel Queen, a Cherokee potter, who we met at the American Indian Heritage Celebration. We asked him what he knew about Will Thomas and the Eastern Band Cherokee. Will Thomas 
he taught us more about the political governments probably more than anybody because he was able to petition the state courts, uh, North Carolina especially, allowing the Eastern Band to stay in the mountains. Um, that's probably the biggest and the greatest thing he done for us was allowing us to stay here instead of going on a removal. Hey, y'all, bingo. Hey, yo, oh, hey. Hey, yo, oh, hey. Hey, hey. Hanu, hey. Hanu, hanu, hey. What became of those hard-won rights? For African Americans, they evaporated after a generation as racism reasserted itself and Jim Crow laws separating whites and blacks became the norm. Sometimes this was subtle, other times it was bloody, as in the 1898 coup in Wilmington. The Cherokee fared better, retaining their land and gaining federal recognition as a tribe, though they lost their other rights, like voting, for a long period. The Lumbee never achieved federal tribal status, even though many of them had supported the North. And women, despite taking charge of so many things during the war, many slipped back into pre-war roles. It wasn't until two generations later that the suffragette movement for voting rights began in North Carolina. This long delay in attaining full civil rights may explain why women are still being disenfranchised, black men are being targeted and killed by the police, and Indians still face difficulties brought on to them by centuries of systematic murder and oppression. While there were many successes and braveries to celebrate, this is not a happy story. It shows a brief window of opportunity seized by enterprising people that closed way too early.